What is this love that won't relent? It's calling out with heaven's breath. Who's reaching out to save our souls? Only you. What is this grace that makes no sense? That we could never recompense? Who gives us all a second chance? Only you, only you, only you. There is no one like our God. stars upon the night show the sun how bright to shine who shaped the world within his hands only you There is 
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Open Bible Church San Jose. We are so glad you are joining us this morning. We are kicking off a new series with the same theme that we talked about last month, but just a little bit of a different twist. So before I even go there, let me say welcome to June. Uh, we are heading into our summer months, and this is the first Sunday in June. And we're using this month, as we did last month, to highlight a very, um, I, I think, vital and important segment of our church family, our church community. Last month, we, uh, because it was Mother's Day month, we talked about the women uh, who uh, really uh, aren't given much focal attention, but yet when you read about them, they had such an incredible impact uh, for the sake of the uh, nation of Israel, for the sake of the early church, and overall the kingdom of God. And this month, with heading into Father's Day, uh, we're focusing that same mindset, but on men who uh, really aren't really who really aren't given much uh, uh, time in the word as far as just uh, word space. But uh, when you read about them, you see that they had really a powerful influence, a powerful impact, and so I'm excited to be able to do that. Not so much for you as much for me because it gives me a chance to. Uh, take a look in deeper ways to some of our uh, early, uh, uh, I think, uh, fathers of the faith, so to speak, or brothers and sisters of the faith, and how much they impacted our, um, our, our community as a community of believers. Well, this morning, um, I really have had a, a propensity to learn more about uh, this man, his name is Apollos, and we read about him in the New Testament. We read about him mainly in the book of Acts, and uh, it is a very uh, interesting uh, look into a man that really, we don't really hear much about, but when whatever we do read, it sounds like, man, this guy had great influence for the sake of the gospel uh, he was a real go-getter. He was a real powerful uh, evangelist and uh, debater of the scriptures that showed that Christ is the Messiah. And we'll, uh, we'll unearth that in the next few minutes. 
but before we do, I want to encourage you to check in with us. If you'll just text to this number, 408-547-4911. Let me give it to you again. 408-547-4911. Text the word here in your first name. Or if you go into the chat uh, in whatever capacity you're watching, whether it's Facebook or whether it's YouTube, just type in your first name and where you are watching from. This helps us to know who is online. It helps us to see what our reach is with our ministry, just to see those who are uh, watching and listening and hopefully being impacted by the Word of God this morning. So the um, question I have is, how about you? Do you have a Bible character uh, or two that you really, really have an affinity towards? And, and not necessarily the big names like David and Daniel and uh, Peter and Paul and, and, you know, where you read about them all the time or they're listed as the heroes of the faith in the uh, book of Hebrews chapter 11. Um, when, you, when you think of somebody that uh, you really want to know more about, learn more about. I think uh, a lot of those individuals, uh, they're kind of hidden in the pages of the Bible, and you really don't know much about them, and you really don't give them much thought. And with that being said, you really don't fully realize the impact that they have uh, within the Old or the, the New Testament uh, setting in which they are, they are mentioned. Um, again, this morning we're going to be looking at uh, a man by the name of Apollos. Apollos was an evangelist, he was an apologist, he was a church leader, and a contemporary and a friend of, of Paul's. Um, when you read about him um, in the book of Acts, you, you see, uh, we'll, we'll come to that in just a moment. Uh, in fact, that's where we're going to take a lot of our study from. But uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians, we see that he's mentioned alongside Paul, but it's in a very competitive um, uh, role uh, designed or put together by the believers there who were, who were saved uh, in the different regions, the different areas, by the different evangelists of, of the gospel. Not everybody who came to Christ during that early church came because of either Peter or Paul. There were others who were evangelizing and having profound impact in the growth and development of the early church, and Apollos is, is one of them. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, we see where Paul is writing to the church, and he says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, verses 10 through 17, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. And he said, my brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. So the, the competition in, uh, in who they were saved under began to create a division and generate quarrels among the different, uh, di the different groups of believers. And Paul goes on to say, what I mean to say is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another I follow Apollos, another I follow Cephas, or who is Peter. Uh, still another says I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanos. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone. Paul usually left the, the baptismal part of things to his, uh, to his church elders and leaders and really didn't uh, partake in that uh, per se, probably for this very reason. And it goes on to say, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So that was in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. A couple of chapters later, Paul addresses it again because it is becoming a major issue in the church. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? 
For when I, one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? After all, what is Apollos, and what is Paul? Uh, only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord is assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God, who makes all things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor, for we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. And so Paul is being very uh, ad adamantly clear that there is no competition among the evangelists, that they are so thrilled when somebody comes to the Lord, whether it's by Paul, Apollos, or Peter, and, and they don't care just as long as they come to the Lord and that they're growing in the Lord and that they are serving the Lord. And that's, that's where the, the, um, uh, Paul is addressing that issue. But I want to I, I wanna say, well, who is this Apollos? Who is this guy? And when you look at the book of Acts in the, in the 18th chapter, um, you, there, there's a brief uh, description or a backstory to uh, Apollos that we don't see in, in the book of 1 Corinthians. And this is a very powerful description of who this man is. And I truly believe that as we begin to break this verse, down, this chapter down, uh, these verses down, that we're going to see uh, a man of God who we should all strive to be like. That we should strive to have the very character traits that he had in his life as, as we uh, live out our lives for the sake of the gospel. And in verse uh, 24 of chapter 18, book of Acts, it says this, Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. So one of the things that we see right off the, right off the bat, he is a native of Alexandria, and he is uh, living or residing in Ephesus, and that's where his ministry is. And, he, and then it says this, he was a learned man with the thorough knowledge of the scriptures. Apollos loved the word of God. Apollos uh, uh, came to know the word of God in such a way because this was what he used to uh, debate the Jews in regard to, um, in regard to the resurrection or the uh, Messiah, uh, Christ being the Messiah. And so Smith Wigglesworth said this. He said, there are four principles we need to maintain. First, read the word of God. Second, consume the word of God until it consumes you. Third, believe the word of God. And fourth, act on the word of God. So the word of God is a very foundational motivation for our faith and our life and our walk in Christ. And, and this is what uh, motivated Apollos to do what he did to be the man that he was, was because he, he knew the word of God. He was a learned man. We read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God, the servant of God, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So, so uh, Paul is writing in Timothy how important it is that we have the word of God uh, active in our, in our lives. And because of that, um, Apollos was absolutely a force to be reckoned with because of his knowledge in the word of God. And that's how he navigated the, the different places that he lived in reaching the lost was through the power of the word of God. So Apollos possessed a rare combination of eloquence and a deep knowledge of the scriptures. Not only did he know it, he could communicate it. Not only could he communicate, but he communicated what he knew and understood and learned. He used his God-given gifts to speak boldly in the synagogues Captivating his audience with his pervasive switch, persuasive, excuse me, persuasive sweet speech. We too are called to utilize our talents and abilities for the advancement of the kingdom of God. We have to really uh, come to that place in our life where the word of God is our priority. Uh, David Platt said, if we want to know the glory of God, 
if we want to experience the beauty of God, and if we want to be used by the hand of God, then we must live in the Word of God. It is the Word of God that gives us uh, wisdom and guidance and direction and how to live our lives in a corrupt and uh, world and in the, uh, in the areas in which God has called us to live. Our culture is broken and messed up and sick and dying and God gives us the power of his word to bring healing and, and to sow seeds of, of, of hope and life and love in, in our culture. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. As believers, our priority should be to study and know the Word of God. To study and know the Word of God. Why is that? Because when we prioritize the Word of God in our lives, we will come to know God, and we will be with, and he, and we will be with God and God with us. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was was with God and the Word was God. When we have the Word of God in our lives, we are connecting ourselves with the power of God through His Word. The second thing that Apollos had was he had a fervor for the Lord. And this was caused by his knowledge of the Word. In verse 25, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John this probably means that Apollos preached repentance and faith in the Messiah. Um, he may even believe that Jesus was the Messiah, uh, but he did not know the full magnitude of who Jesus was, his death and his resurrection. Uh, Aquila and Priscilla, friends of Paul, spent some time with Apollos and filled in the gaps in his understanding of, of Christ as found in um, uh, the 26th verse, which we'll read in just a moment. So Apollos' ministry bore fruit as he journeyed into Acacia, and there he fervently preached the gospel, refuting his opponents, which, are, which were the Jewish leaders of the day, the Jewish synagogue leaders, and with sound doctrine and compelling arguments. And how did he do that? Through the word. His influence extended beyond just mere words. He played a vital, pivotal role in strengthening and encouraging the early believers and just an aside, we are called to be instruments of God's grace impacting lives and communities through our witness and our service as well. So what we see in Apollos, we just don't sit back in an in a, uh, armchair, easy chair, applauding and say, hey, go Apollos. Thank you, Jesus, for the life of Apollos. Thank you for what he did. What it should do is it stir in us to be like Apollos. As we read about Paul and all the others, those, their, their lives should stir us to be, to be just like them. You know, Jesus said that uh, if, if we claim to be in him, we must walk as he did. There has to be a stirring for us to be like those that are having uh, an impact and making a difference for the sake of the kingdom of God. And so when you look at fervor, when you, when you understand what fervor is, fervor is a passion. It's to have a passion. Do you have a passion for the things of God? Do you have a passion for the word of God? Do you have a passion for the church of God? Do you have a passion for the people of God? Do you have a passion to reach lost souls? Do you have a passion to populate heaven with, with people coming to know Jesus because of your witness and because the example of your, of your life? Soren Kierkegaard said, hope is passion for what is possible. Where do we find our hope? Our hope is in Jesus Christ. Our hope is in the word of God that promises us uh, uh, that Jesus is the Messiah, promises us that there is an eternity waiting uh, for us, promises us that there is everlasting life, promises us that there is hope and that there is joy found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the fervor that, that Apollos had. Wherever he went, there was a passion that just exuded out of his pores as he shared the life-changing power of the, of, of the life of Jesus Christ. He made a difference because he had the fervor and the passion of Christ in his life. And then it goes on to say in verse 26, I told you I, I, I would touch base with that. And this is about Apollos, excuse me, this is about Priscilla and Aquila, who God brought into Apollos' life to teach him greater ways about, the, about Jesus himself. And this is what it says. 
He began to speak boldly in the synagogues. And when Priscilla and Aquila heard of him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. So what they did is, is they, they talked to him about his baptism in John. And then they talked to him about his baptism in Jesus and what that looked like. And they began to fill in all those gaps that, that he didn't know. And, it, and he just became even more powerful for the sake of the gospel because now he saw who the Messiah really, really was. And he understood deeper uh, what, what the scriptures were saying about Christ as the Messiah. Despite his impressive background, we see that Apollos de demonstrated humility and teachability by allowing Aquila and Priscilla, fellow believers, uh, to, to speak into his life. They noticed gaps in his understanding of the gospel. Apollos did not resist any training, teaching, correcting. Remember what the Word of God does? It trains, it teaches, it rebukes, it corrects. And, and that's what they used the Word of God to do, to show him a greater way. Instead, he humbly received their instruction, allowing himself to be sharpened and refined in his ministry. We need to be the same mind, uh, heart and mind as Apollos. We need to be teachable and we need to be humble, realizing that there are those that are out there that can teach us a thing or two about our walk in the Lord. And I want to encourage you to be that. Be humble and be teachable, to be open to correction, to be open to training, and how God can use you and, you and work in you for the sake of the kingdom of God. Richard G. Scott said this, to be humble is to be teachable. To be humble is to be teachable. God, make me teachable. And if I'm going to be teachable, I have to be humble. And I have to recognize that, that there are many around me and many still to come in my life that are going to teach me things about Christ, teach me things about faith, and I need to be humbly teachable. And then, and then in verse 27, we read that Apollos humbly helped the other believers. So it wasn't all about Apollos. You know, I've, I've seen guys uh, who had big names and big ministries, and, and they, they didn't have time for anybody else. They had uh, this holier-than-thou attitude. They were separated from, from the masses, so to speak, because they had a message and they had a word and and they had a ministry, and, and, and nobody could even get close to them uh, because they, they didn't want to bother or be bothered. Not Apollos. Apollos was right there in the midst, helping people and, and encouraging them in their, in their faith. When Apollos wanted to go to Acacia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him, wrote to the disciples there to welcome him, and it says, when he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. So he just got right in there. And what Priscilla and Aquila did for him in teaching and training him, he in turn did to others. He began to teach and to train and to raise up leaders and, uh, and to send people out for the sake of the kingdom of God. He saw that the only way that he could have any impact was not to be the one bringing the message, not to be the one leading the, the uh, services, but to raise other people up. And, and to send them out so that the uh, reach was, was even more magnified as, as he sent more and more people out for the sake of the kingdom of God. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16 says, And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God, excuse me, God is pleased. So don't forget to do good and to share with others. Be humble to help other believers. Be humble to help those around you? Are, you? are you helping other people in their walk of faith? Are you helping other people in their walk with the Lord? Martin Luther King Jr. said this, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? What are you doing for others? I love that because I think sometimes people think the question is, is what's in it for me? Or what can you do for me? And, and let me tell you what, that is, that is a destructive, selfish, question mindset to have and and I can't I can't honestly say to you that I've never said that sometimes I feel like what is in it for me God what what about me and and then God immediately corrects me and I got to go right back to that dynamic of being humble and understanding that it's not about me 
But it's about God and what God wants to do. And what God wants to do is God wants to use you. God wants to use me. God used Apollos to help other believers in their walk with the faith. And the last thing I want to share, and probably the, one of the more important things in my mind for me personally, so however you take this is up to you, but for me personally, it deals with, uh, it deals with having the fire of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's that, that's that fervor, that's that passion, that's that motivation, that's that drive, that's that sense of purpose, sense of calling that we have in our lives is to, is to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And it goes back to um, him talking about Jesus' baptism, and I'll go over that in just a minute. But the dynamic of this, for he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. He vigorously refuted, passionately. He was, there was something that burned inside of him that, that he just couldn't contain and couldn't control. And it reminds me, of Jeremiah, the prophet, in the book of Jeremiah, in chapter 20, Jeremiah is bringing the word of God of uh, repentance and judgment to the nation of Israel, and they're rebuking him, they're mocking him, they're, you know, they're torturing him, they, they, they didn't want to hear what he had to say, but he, he, he didn't stop. But then, in chapter 20, he has a conversation with God, and he's recognizing, God, what's the use? Why do I have to keep torturing myself? Why do I have to keep putting myself in this place when, when they're not listening? They don't care. They hate me. They hate you. So let's just let them go to hell. Let's just let them die in their sin. Let's just let them be destroyed by the, uh, by the captors, and, and then we can just wash our hands of them. And, and um, he said this. Jeremiah in chapter 20, verses 8 9. He said, Whenever I speak, I cry out proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. They, they just abused Jeremiah because of his, because of his call, to, uh, call to come back to God, call to repentance. Then it says, But if I say, I will not mention his word, or speak, his, or speak any more in his name. His word is like a fire in my heart. A fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. That is my prayer that the word of God just burns in my heart. It burns in my bones that I cannot hold it in. And that I can do nothing but but speak it regardless of what the people think or how they receive it. The word of God burns in my life. And that's what Apollo, he had the word of God burning in his life. And there was nothing that could keep him, that passion, that fervor from, from sharing. And that's why he made such a powerful distance, uh, difference in people's lives. That's why some of the people were looking at his life as, as a powerful evangelist and saying, man, I want to follow that guy. Paul wasn't a fiery evangelist. In fact, Paul said, I put people to sleep. Paul said, I'm, I'm a horrible speaker. <coughs> and so, so people look at Paul and look at him, and he had all the, the, the charisma and the, the, the dynamic of a powerful speaker and a leader. And uh, that's why there was a division. Ah, Paul, forget him. Man, I want to follow Apollos. So there's such a powerful draw to him because of his fervor and because of his fire. And you know what? Um, I, I was reading a, a little bit about uh, a, 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 an old-time uh, evangelist. His name was Reinhard um, uh, Bonnke, and, and he said that when he talked about the passion and the fire of the Holy Spirit, and he said this, God's children were never meant to be tamed. He said, when we surrender to Jesus, we walk of the Holy Spirit to abide in us, and he is anything but tame. The Holy Spirit leads us on rescue missions in the world, fanning the flame of the fiery dove. 2,000 years ago on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit crowned each of the 120 with fire. They were never the same. We are called to partner gloriously with a God who is an all-consuming fire. You are called to burn uh, with the fire of the Holy Spirit. 
a fire that is passionate for the things of heaven and dangerous to the things of hell. God's desire is that for, for us to know the Holy Spirit and to burn without apology and with intention. Our passion will be kindled and intensified as, as, we, as we get to know God in a deeper way. You will be fueled to stir God's passion for souls, for the impossible, and for the extraordinary. Uh, we will know him and demonstrate his indwelling as we yield to the instruction that he gives to us through his word. Jesus desires for people to see God in your eyes. Uh, the Holy Spirit is a person, and he longs to commune, to cohabitate with us. Bonke says we are to live in the reality of his constant presence. And that's the way um, Apollos lived his life. He, is, he prioritized the word of God, spending time with God, and allowing God to just totally consume and fill his heart and, and, and to um, uh, fuel his passion for the sake of the gospel for others. And then in verse 25, it said he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. Remember I said, talked about the baptism of John. Well, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, uh, John said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And so John was talking about the baptism of Jesus. And so when Apollo and, uh, excuse me, when Priscilla and Aquila uh, taught Apollos, they taught him about the baptism of Jesus, the baptism of, of the Holy Spirit and fire. Samuel Chadwick said, men ablaze are invincible. Hell trembles when men kindle. The stronghold of Satan is proof against everything but fire. The church is powerless without the flame of the Holy Ghost. Destitute of fire, nothing else really counts. Possessed of fire, nothing else really matters. The one vital need is fire. Without the flame and fervor of the Holy Ghost, the church will never accomplish its mission. So we need more fire of the Holy Spirit in our church. We need more fire uh, uh, and passion for the Word of God within our churches. When I think about the man, the life of an Apollos, I think about a man who was completely, radically sold out for God. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, 17, Paul wrote, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because it is the power of God uh, that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For the gospel uh, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, the righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So that whole dynamic is, is the word of God. Uh, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I am not ashamed of the power of the word of God. I need the Holy Spirit's power <coughs> and fire in my life. I want to close with this quote. Soren Kierkegaard said this, this age will die, not as a result of some evil, but from a lack of passion. This, this, <coughs> excuse me, this age will die, not because of some evil, but because of a lack of passion. We need to restore that passion for the sake of the kingdom of God back into our people. Without that passion, without that fervor, without that fire, the, the, the church will slowly dwindle and, and my challenge to us this morning is to be and have the heart uh, of an Apollos for the things of God, for the sake of the kingdom of God, so that we can bring people to Jesus. As we close this morning and reflect on the life of Apollos, let's be inspired by example of effective ministry, that passion and that fire of the Holy Spirit. May we, like him, boldly proclaim the gospel, humbly receive correction and instruction, tirelessly labor for the advancement of God's kingdom. Let us go forth with renewed zeal and passion and fervor and fire, knowing God can use ordinary individuals like us to accomplish extraordinary things for the sake of his glory. Apollos labored in the Lord's work, aiding in the ministry of the apostles, faithfully building up the church. His life should encourage each of us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and to use our God-given gifts to promote the, the passion of the truth. God bless you. Let me pray with you and encourage you this morning to, to walk in that um, power, to walk in that fire. God, we just open up our hearts and our lives this morning to fill us with the Holy Spirit. Fill us with the fire of 
and the passion of the Word of God. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come into our heart, into our lives. Fill us with, with everything that is of God so that we may become the people of God to do the things of God in the, in the time of God, for the will of God, for the sake of the kingdom of God, so that others may come to know you in power and in, uh, and in victory. God, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen, amen. God bless you. Starting next week, we are going to be doing a series of, uh, of sermonettes uh, called Summer in, the, uh, uh, Summer in the Psalms. And uh, Caleb and I, over the next, um, next uh, eight to ten weeks, we are going to be bringing uh, a, a psalm of choice, and we're going to be uh, reflecting on that 10 to 15 minutes or so of a devotional. But what we're encouraging everybody to do, starting on the 3rd of June, we are encouraging everybody to begin reading psalms, two psalms a day, through uh, June 3rd to the, to, towards the end of August is 75 days. And if you read two psalms a day, you'll have read through the whole book of psalms uh, during the summer. So two psalms a day. And we're going to be sending out some more information. But starting next week, we're going to be looking at the psalms. And we're not going to be going concurrently, uh, numerically through the psalms. We're, Caleb and I are just going to pick a, a, a few of the psalms that are of our favorites. And we're going to try to... Um, uh, speak on them during uh, the time that you would have covered the reading of them as well. So we're excited about that, something different, something that you can be uh, looking forward to every week as we take a moment to uh, pause and as we take this summer to go through the book of Psalms. God bless you, we love you, we appreciate you, and we'll see you next week. was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace, so oh washes over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new now life begins with you Please from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was ransomed, fully before. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, your grace, so washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new, now life begins with you. Our Savior displayed on Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had won. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free 
Your 